but maybe we can record and then uh, choose just in case you, I don't know, not recording gives people a, a little bit of freedom to say what they really feel. And so that's always great. Um, uh, I, I fear our internet might be a little intermittent. We're in the, we're having a snowstorm here. So we have fewer people in the room than normally, but we have 70 people online. So that's fantastic. Um, what I'm gonna ask for is all of you people at home, please show your faces, all right? Uh, Deva and Steve don't wanna sit here and look at a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, black squares with names. They could do that on their own. Um, so show your faces. And if you have a question, throw your name in the chat. Only I see that. So go ahead and throw your name in the chat. And I'm gonna just ask a couple questions. And, um, and then we're gonna turn it over to them. Uh, first, I wanna thank you for making this beautiful movie. I love this movie so much. And um, it was so funny, Steve, when we sat down there for dinner, I was like, I know I've seen you before. I know I've seen you before. And he was like, well, I made this little documentary called <laughs> Tubs Over Broadway. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> of course. Um, so my question is, um, first, I would love to hear about the, you know, there feels like there's this sort of um, linear structure to the documentary uh, that includes things like uh, first you're starting collecting and then you're starting meeting people and then then the show ends and you know and it's sort of and, and you write a book but I picked up in just an interview uh, earlier that David when you came on the book was already written yeah and so I'm curious about when you came in to actually start shooting things and how you decided to structure it and how you made that work yeah well um yeah, Steve had written the book and and uh, it was getting press and everything. And he said some people had reached out to him about doing a documentary. And I was like, well, they don't know you like I do. I should be the one doing this documentary. And um, or you, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, I I got my start as an editor. That's how I met him. I was an editor at the Late Show uh, for several years. And um, but I had been in LA making documentaries for a while. Um, after I left the show. And so we hadn't worked together in a while. And, um, but he told me he had this book out and, and, uh, and I knew I wanted to do, as soon as I listened to the songs, I understood, oh my God, these things are crazy. I mean, he sent me a CD and the bathrooms, you know, my bathroom was on it. And it was like, this is crazy. It's funny and beautiful and sad at the same time. And how does nobody know about this? Um, but, uh, as far as the structure of the film, the trick was that nobody knows about corporate musicals, what they are, uh, they have no reason to care about them. Yeah. And so I thought, well, let's just take people on the same journey that Steve went on. And that's to make fun of them, which we all do at the beginning. And then to dig into, is there, what's what's really, what else is going on here? And that's, so that's why I structured it that way. It was like, I want people to go on the same journey that he did into falling in love with the people that made these. And I assume this is a follow-up question. I assume then, Steve, that in most cases, when you we see you meeting these people, you're not meeting them for the first time, or are you? And in almost all cases, I was meeting them for the first time. Hank Beebe, uh, who I had first started talking to in the uh, mid-90s, that's how far back in history, the early stages of this went. He came to New York City once in 1997, and I already kind of had a few of these records, and I went to meet him. He was conducting a performance of a musical he had written, and I was excited to see him. I got my records autographed, but uh, I don't think I'd ever met Sheldon Harnick before. Uh, definitely uh, was meeting Pat for the first time. Didn't know Sandy was coming. That scene in That's the hotel yeah, lobby, yeah. that was all... A plus 100% real, and I was truly surprised. Uh, I had spoken to Sid Siegel finally on the phone, but had never met him until the day we went up to his house with the, the van full of equipment and all that. So uh, it was really, that stuff was all real. And uh, It's we, all real. Yes, it's real in the <laughs> sense that- they are real, yeah. But like when I'm knocking on Hank Beebe's door for the first time, I had never been to that house before in Portland, yeah. Maine. So I want to say it's all real in the sense that 
first time meetings that you're seeing are really first time meetings, even if I talk to people on the phone, I'd never seen them before. Yeah. So I feel uninformed because I haven't read the book. And does the book focus just more on the history of it without having those personal connections or a little bit of both? Uh, it's more of a, I don't know, an extremely fun, well-illustrated encyclopedia. It's more like, here's the big chapter on all the records I know of from the 1950s. And my co-author and I, Sport Murphy, we write up little essays about them, put in pictures of the album covers. By then, I was definitely meeting many of these people and interviewed them. So there's anecdotes from Hank Beebe or Michael Brown. I did not know Sid yet at that point. So it was not really a story about my journey in the same way that uh, David right. said. This is how we're going to get people interested in this is right. the yeah. human connection. Excellent. And um, Dave, uh, so then my other question is about your the final number, because you, you, this whole movie is so great. And then with that final number, it just like kind of shoots out of the stratosphere as far as I can't believe I'm watching this. So was it all along, if we're going to make a movie, we have to do this? Or did it come to you in a flash? Or tell me about just the idea for that. It was definitely gradual. I mean, I saved a chunk of my budget for something I wanted. I knew I had to have something special. Uh, part of that was the animation. I knew I wanted something like that. Um, but the finale number that kind of came gradually as as I realized that so much of the story, like when we started, I didn't really understand that it was going to be so much about him meeting these people and connecting to them, like his right. heart and finding like a new path in his life. Right. The, I didn't know the show was going to end like not, I didn't, you know, um, so it was it was little things like he would get teary eyed when he would talk about the composers um, telling them that their work mattered, that kind of stuff, uh, all that it would start like, this is what this is about, you know? And so uh, eventually it came to like, we have to do, we have to utilize the power of musical theater to say what his journey has been. And then it kind of eventually it was, let's have all the people that he met along the way, meet up with him, you know, and, and, I had this chunk of money reserved. And so we we shot a musical number at on the Warner Brothers lot in one day, weeks and weeks of planning, but one day of shooting is all we had money for. Did yeah. And David, did you present that idea to Steve? How did Steve, how did that, uh, do well, you remember? I, I just want to emphasize to everybody, I am not a filmmaker. I had no decisions about what was going to happen with this movie. I had zero creative control except for writing songs, the two original songs. So Dave would say, I think we should do this or I want to do that. And I felt very confident that it was going to be great because I knew her and knew her work. But I did think in the case of the finale, yes, that is the last card to play. We've shown all through this movie how unlikely creativity blossoms and catches hold of people and, and grabs them even decades later from people who weren't in the original audience. I thought we have to, we have to, we have to uh, do our own version of something like that and show that uh, we've absorbed it and now we're ready to put it out in the world oursel ourselves. Yeah, it's just the perfect finale. It's so great. I, the last question, the last question I'll, I'll ask, it's not really questions, it's a statement. I want to, I want to give a, uh, a comment about Jello Biafra, <laughs> <laughs> who I, who I love, not just from the dead Kennedys, but I love because I'm a San Francisco guy. And when I was in high school in the eighties, um, one of my, I was, I worked for the newspaper, the high school newspaper. And one of my buddies said, I want to interview Jello Biafra and just got a hold of his contact. And they, he did this full, like three page long sit down interview with the 16 year old kid. And I just mm -hmm. thought from here on, Jello Biafra. Awesome. Yeah. So when I first saw this, I was like, oh, that's so perfect that he's that he's in that this is part of his uh, world as well. So. He was all in on that musical number too. He brought different shirts, like which one fits best. And like, he was fully, fully invested in making that great, which is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I just love that this whole saga brought me in contact, not only with people like 
composers and Hank and Sid and Michael Brown. But suddenly I'm hanging out with punk rock guys. And I, I'm, I was never a punk rock guy myself, <laughs> shockingly. But suddenly, like, we're, we've got this eye-to-eye -eye connection on something very strange. But we like Don Bowles also another person i should not know this person let alone be friends with him but like yeah it turned out these beautiful friendships all over the the compass were just like blossoming from genuine curiosity that brings people together and it's really i mean again on a tangent but it's really going to you david one of my favorite things about making documentaries is how kind of deeply connected you become to a subject that is so specific and so so I knew, you know, I loved uh, Two Trains Running and just the idea of like floating in that world with those people and how, uh, you know, how, how that is in your own, how enriching it is to your, yourself as a filmmaker. Absolutely. That is the number one thing I love about documentary. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We got some great film students here with questions. If you guys who have questions want to line up here, I'm going to start with Dakota. Dakota wrote me a uh, no, even when I was setting up saying, can I ask the first question? So mm -hmm. Dakota, where are you? Thanks. Hi. Hey. Hey there. So I'm a senior here at UVU, or I guess I'm going into my senior year uh, in the cinematography track here at UVU. Um, I watched Two Trains Running, obviously Bathtubs Over Broadway, and I'm a huge fan of, of, of both of your works. Um, I, I mostly had a question, I guess for both of you, it was mostly directed towards Steve, because um, clearly the subject matter of the film is this very, very specific niche interest. And throughout the film, as we get to know and become more involved with it the way that he was, uh, towards the end, we basically see that it becomes like financially lucrative. It becomes something that's generated like profit and success within your life. So I basically had like the question, how would you recommend to other filmmakers? Like, how do you take such a like, niche idea of something that you're so passionate and love what steps can someone do to turn those kinds of things into like lucrative outlets in their life? Hmm. Uh, I wouldn't say that the, the whole collecting biz has been terribly lucrative. I, mm -hmm. I did start going out and doing one man shows where I would show the film clips and sell a little merch and that was fun and it made a little money. And uh, I, I hope to continue to do that. It was kind of on pause with the pandemic. But uh, I guess, Deva, this is more of a question for you. Ultimately, do documentary people pick subjects because they think this will make money or you just think I got to do this and money making will be secondary because I wouldn't know how to think about that. I didn't get into my hobbies because I thought they were going to be monetized. Right. I, I think Steve and I are really similar in that we just it was you know, it was like, for me, it was this documentary needs to be done. Nobody's done it before. And, and, uh, definitely <laughs> did not make any money on it. Um, and then, uh, and yeah, Steve, I think, you know, uh, it's very gratifying to have a book out there, but it's not like mm -hmm. he, he made a lot of money on that. It's just, this needs to be done. And hopefully we'll find people who appreciate the book and the documentary as we go. And that's, but I think that's that would be the guide. It's do, do you love this enough to devote years of your life to it without making money? <laughs> I would add that <laughs> like there's, gonna... there's a common thread uh, between Deva, people like Hank Beebe, and people like the, the publisher of the book, this little tiny imprint called Blast Books. The commonality there is all three of them would tell you, if I'm going to do something, it's because I really want to do it as good as it can be done. I care about this enough that I will not accept doing even a B plus job. Hank Beebe and all the people like him, they could not bear to do anything less than their best work every time. Uh, Blast Books worked, sweated the details on this book and made it so gorgeous. And then Deva said, as she went along, as I knew she would, uh, this, this is pretty good but there, there, there's a vision up ahead of how it can be better and better and better and and that is what I think I I have been inspired by in all these different realms the people who think I don't care if no one will ever truly understand I have to do it right for myself it was so hard to get money to make this because everybody thought it would be a real 
educational exercise about you know in the 1950s this kind of industrial musical will happen in the 1960s it was like like a very kind of staid kind of pbs thing and i was like no no it's gonna be entertaining i mean i hope i hope you found it entertaining that was was. my goal yeah wonderful (laughs) thank you so much thanks I had family members and friends who knew I'd been collecting this stuff for a long time and they'd even seen the book. They were kind of aware of it. And even they going into the movie just thought, oh, you know, this is going to be sort of a a mildly cute, snarky look at this thing that we don't really care about, but we're showing up because we're supporting our friend or whatever. And oh, my God, this is it. They could not have seen what was coming. And time after time, people just thought, I, I, I didn't know how to imagine that this movie would be so big and powerful. Yeah, it is kind of like, it is kind of like, you know, telling students here, oh, you guys got, got to come see this movie. It's about industrial musicals. Right. That's, that's <laughs> the tragedy of it. And, but also, if anybody bothers to sit down, we think they're going to be happy they did. But yes, as Deva alluded to, people just thought, oh, so it's like this kitschy thing. And people, oh, uh, people will lose interest after 15 minutes. Uh, no, we're not interested. Uh, well, it's hard to, and then David began shooting bits and editing things together and then showing them to people and, I, I think you've told me you showed some important people the sequence when I was on stage with Pat. I played guitar and she sang my bathroom finally in the modern era to an auditorium full of people. And yeah, and the- people got it. People finally said, oh, this is about how do you figure out what's important in your life? Okay, we see the movie now. A big yeah. money guy. I got a big money guy to cry and he gave me some money. <laughs> right. That's always good. Yeah. I hope you all liked it. What's I hope that? there weren't too many technical issues with you watching. Yeah, I hear you. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead and introduce yourself. And I just want to make sure people at home, I see Addison has a hand up icon. I won't see that. You have to have your name in the chat. Hello, my name Hi. is Granite, and I'm in my fourth year here at UVU. Uh, I really liked the seeing the actual musicals and hearing the songs, and I guess my question is, could you tell us more, a little bit about the process of going through archival footage and like any advice about what you choose to put in? Oh man. Well, the, the I mean, oh God, I could talk for hours about the archival. I would try not to bore you all. Um, that was the most thrilling part was finding this material. Some of it Steve had, or his friends had, some of it was new discovery. Like when we went to the library of Congress, he, we were finding stuff that he'd never seen before. I mean, that is just, it was so thrilling to me. Um, we found a lot of stuff after the movie was over that st- still pisses me off that it's not in the movie, like really great stuff like the GE musical is not in there. But anyway, um, as far as what to include and what not to include, I wish I had been able to put longer clips of the musicals in, um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the clips I had were from after um, 1978. And so anything before 1978, I could use via the fair use doctrine um, well, not anything, but it was case by case basis, anything after 1978, which is a lot of great stuff that I had, uh, didn't, it it was, you had to, or I actually, I had to apply the fair use doctrine, meaning I could only use enough to, to prove a point. Um, and so that's why some of the clips are very short, uh, because I didn't want to get sued by anybody. Um, prior to that, it was like, doing research and are any of these in public domain or do the composers have the rights they can give me? And it was just this really crazy dance. Basically with archival, it's a good idea to have a professional archival producer who knows all the footage houses that can get you a good deal. Um, And then also a great lawyer, a great fair use attorney. So that's my advice. But I think this movie was unusual because so much of the archival footage was stuff that was supposed to have been thrown away. And even the companies themselves didn't know it existed. Like I would have 
the uh, Firestone film or a, a Chevy film or whatever. And we would approach or Deva and her team would various corporations and they would have no idea what she was talking about. And they were stunned to hear that these things had ever existed. No one alive in the company now had the foggiest idea that they had used to do done musicals. And so you would occasionally very luckily hit on something. I think we had some great con connections at Ford and, yeah. and got things out of a Ford archive and the Ford people were, Oh, who knew we didn't know this stuff existed. And then we went in the back room and, we didn't know, but uh, most documentary films are not going to be dealing with stuff that was by its nature, hidden, secret, ephemeral, meant to be thrown away. So that was a, a very strange circumstance. And the records also, very few of the shows ever produced a souvenir record. My record collection is pretty big now by my standards, but I think there were thousands of these shows, many thousands, and most of them just disappeared forever when they were done and weren't recorded at all. And the ones that were recorded were never supposed to be really heard by anyone outside the company. So a lot of strange headwinds against gathering this material. Just be diligent. That's my best advice. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best part of that's another I have so many best parts of making documentaries I love researching archival thanks excellent <clears throat> I, uh, I I just you know as I was watching I was thinking um uh that you know when you're a theatrical Broadway actor the worst thing you can have is a show that closes right away you know, and I kept thinking about these guys doing these shows, knew they were performing one night only sort of shows and how interesting that was. Okay, we were gonna hear from Chip Baldwin, I believe. Chip. Hey, right here. Hey, Chip. Hi, this one's for you. So um, I was just wondering, like, when you're making a documentary on like this scale, like what is the biggest logistics obstacle you come across? Um, well, it's funny because it was, it was really actually a small scale film. Uh, I wore so many hats uh, because I had been an editor before. Um, I could edit it myself, uh, as far as the biggest logistics problem, um, it was really just keeping enough funds to, to be able to keep doing shoots. Um, so when I did, but you know, when I didn't have money, I would just shoot it myself. So if there's anything in there that doesn't look so good, that's probably something I shot. Um, yeah, the, that was it. it was, I, I don't, I don't ask people to work for free. Uh, I have a really hard time with that. So I want people to get paid something. And so if I didn't have money, I would just do it all myself, which sometimes really sucks. Um, you know, but on the other hand, I think some of my favorite scenes are also things that I shot myself because Steve was more comfortable with just having me around versus, you know, the boom in front of his face and all that stuff. So I think even that wasn't so bad. Yeah, I don't know. Is there anything more specific that you, um, it, it, did I answer that right? Or is there another angle that you were kind of hoping for? I think you hit the nail on the head there. So okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just getting work a lot of it yourself if you're just starting out and yeah. It was very much a, a homegrown thing for a long time. Like when I said to Deva, oh, I'm going to be in Chicago. I have this uh, business thing to do, but I'm also going to try to meet Pat when I'm there. And she said, well, I guess I'd better get there with my camera. And so suddenly she was uh, there and capturing these incredible moments. And also, uh, oh, I'm going to do this show and I'm going to bring her out on stage. Well, I guess I better get on a plane right now with my camera and get and, and thank God she did, because these are uh, crucial moments in the film. And they were basically done by you just like, I think, bought an airline ticket with points from your credit card and say, well, what else can I do? Yeah, I would like a C-100 or something like nothing. Fancy. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I wondered how uh, I wondered how um, how she didn't see you if there was a film crew following you. But now I know. So. Which uh, which one when Pat when he said uh, when yeah. 
Yeah. Pat and Sandy surprised him. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that one was one where Pat called me and said, I have a surprise. We knew we were meeting Pat. And then, but then Pat called me on the phone and said, I have, I have a surprise. I'm bringing Sandy. And I was like, oh shit, I did not bring enough microphones for it. But I was like, okay, we'll just do the best we can do. And I had a great DP that day and she's good with Verite. And I was just, I said, whatever you do, do not indicate to Steve anything that's going on. We're just following him. If he figures it out, he figures it out, whatever, just, you know, and, uh, and he, yeah, he, he was definitely flummoxed I had no idea. <laughs> Broke the fourth um, wall at one point, yeah. wandering in this hotel lobby. I'm looking for a, a one woman by herself with possibly dark hair or possibly gray hair. I don't know. And I don't see a woman by herself. And so I turned to the camera and went. <laughs> yeah. But they, Pat and Sandy both knew there would be a camera crew there. Yeah. So. They knew. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Chad. I am in my second year, I think, and I'm in the editing track. Uh, right now, currently, I do a bunch of marketing work. Um, so I guess that's my question is how you said this was a smaller documentary. So I'm wondering how you guys marketed it, how you mentioned that you got money from some guy, how you got that money and kind of went from the finished project to, you know, Netflix. Uh, well, it was... Um... At first it was me paying for it, which don't do that. Um, try not to do that. Don't use your own money. Uh, you know, whatever you can do without spending a lot of money to prove your concept to people is what you have to do. So it was, it was me just going out with whatever camera I could get and shooting what I could get to prove the concept. So it was pulling some archival. I mean, you edit, so it's, you know, editing a great pitch and having a good pitch deck. Um, and I just did that for, it took forever really. Cause it took a long time to like shoot enough to actually get people to understand what I was doing. And so that was like two years that I was shooting whenever I could. And then we did like fundraiser <laughs> fundraiser and like, yeah. Um, that kind of thing, like getting donations, tax deductible donations. I had a couple of nice donors um early on to get us through and then finally finally i had a kick-ass kick-ass trailer and pitch deck that i could we got into the sundance producing lab and then sundance that really opened a lot of doors for us so so it was just applying to every single thing that we could you know trying to get people to understand what we, it's that thing of like in the film, they, they couldn't see what Steve saw. It was like the same thing. It's like, please see what I see. It's going to be awesome. And, and uh, eventually through the Sundance producing lab, we got connected to impact partners and they, you know, we made one of their people cry and he said, okay, let's, you want to partner with Blumhouse. We want to partner with Blumhouse to give you money. And, you know, there's when people give you money though, you have, it's, there are going to be strings attached. And so it's a matter of, you know, nothing's free. Right. So that, that was a whole other story once we got the money, but, um, we had a really, this is the other thing. Uh, we finally finished the film. They, everybody was happy with it. We premiered at Tribeca. The premiere was incredible. It was, people were, I mean, I don't even, know how to describe how amazing it was they gave us some funds to do a musical number after the movie I mean it was totally crazy but we couldn't sell the movie after that which was nuts and um eventually 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 focus features came in and picked it up and um uh, they um Netflix kind of got it through focus so it wasn't a Netflix original mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, even after its triumphant premiere and the buzz about it, it still had this uh, sort of glass ceiling of if you try to tell people in a sentence or two what it's about, they're not going to jump to their feet and say, let me at it. They're going to say, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And so uh, that, that could be tricky even after it's winning awards. Yeah, it's a hard log line uh, to figure totally. out. Totally. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's one of the biggest things I learned 
for future projects is if you're going to do something about something weird, you're going to have a tough go of it. It needs to be something that a sales agent who doesn't want to, you know, they don't want to work that hard. They, it's like, they want to just be able to, okay, this is about Beyonce. This is about a uh, true crime, you know? And, and if you it's, love, what? You love, you love Mr. Rogers, right? Here's a movie about right. Mr. Rogers. I understand Mr. Rogers. I understand true crime. Corporate Ruth music. Ruth Ginsburg. It's perfect. It's already sold. Yeah. So that's a big thing I learned. Um, sales agents, distributors, if you're going to do, if you're going to do something weird, you have to have a kick-ass trailer to, uh, to help them see, because they're not going to watch the whole movie. And yeah, um, they have, they have limited time and, um, maybe limited curiosity. So you have to, it has to be that fast for them to understand it. Big lesson. Awesome. Still, I'm glad we did it the way we did it, but thank you. Yeah. All right. We have Jack. Hello, uh, I'm Jack. Um, this is uh, my first semester in the program. Um, uh, well, first off, I just wanted to say thank you guys for all the work that you've done to uh, bring attention to this incredible work. And I think it's uh, really something special. Thank you. Um, and then uh, I was just curious. Well, I, I was really surprised to see uh, you know, not one, but two uh, punk rock icons in this and that they're like such uh, huge fans of these industrial musicals. Um, and uh, Steve, you mentioned how you had connected with Don Bowles, but I was just curious uh, how you met Jello Biafra. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's quite a while ago now. I think it was probably over 20 years ago. I think it was another record collector who I somehow had met in New York. I would go to record shows and talk to people and try to find out if anybody knew what I was talking about, which was very, very difficult. And then somebody said, oh yeah, you know, I think I've, you know, I've got a couple of those records, you know, who has some really weird stuff is a friend of a friend, uh, Jello Biafra, you know, Dead Kennedys. And I very, very vaguely knew what that was. I did. I had not come up through any of that music, but suddenly I'm on the phone with him and he seems like a great guy. And we're talking about stuff. And he at some point came into New York City and, hey, can I come over to the Letterman show and hang out? Sure. And eh, sitting in my office in the afternoon and somebody later said, was I hallucinating or did I see Jello Biafra in your office today? What is up? I said, it's hard to explain, but yes, we're friends for a very oddly specific reason. Yeah, but he is a very uh, cool guy, very passionate. And uh, and uh, of course, the records is just a tiny sliver of, of, of what he's up to. So I, I feel very, very gratified that he would want to ever hang out with me because he seems way too cool for me. All right. Well, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for answering my question. Just for being here tonight. Yep. Hi, I'm Hayden. I'm a post production student, and I'm really curious about how uh, what role each of you played in coming up with some of the more creative scenes, such as like the scene near the start of the movie with the kitchen appliances and the songs going along with it. I'm curious uh, what the dynamic and coming up with and planning those scenes was like. Well, we, I had always had this idea in my head of, I wanted people to understand that there was um, this kind of other force that was acting on Steve, like helping him see this stuff that other people weren't seeing. And so um, at first, I, I guess I was, I was, I had this image of him being in Times Square and like all the brands were kind of surrounding him, whatever. But then it, it was like, no, we have these great appliance songs. It's like, he wakes up in the morning and he's got these things in his head and like, he doesn't understand why they're you know, 
still in his head after all this time. They were supposed to be just dumb little corporate songs. Why are they still there? And so it was like, let's make the music notes be the kind of magic that um, that surrounds him and 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 infects his brain. And so that's how they eventually they became this little motif that it's like the the earworm the you know the magic that gets in his head that that finds him like they found him even from the beginning of the movie they kind of come out over an aerial of new york and wind their way down to the late show and find him and circle him and yeah so it's like it was like uh they needed someone to find them yeah. and yeah. this was all deva as, as i was saying i was not coming to her with pitches for what should be in a movie <laughs> A documentary subject does not do that unless you're, I don't know, some fabulous pop star who gets to there control you know. what's in the movie. That is not cool in the world of documentary from what I've come to understand. So uh, I was along for the ride on this, although uh, I was thrilled, number one, with all these great things that were happening. And yes, in my real life, I'll see something somewhere and that will remind me, oh, look at that junction box from the ITE Corporation. I happen to know that Girl uh, Gould Inc. merged with ITE in the 70s, and then I'll start singing one of the Gould songs, and I'm just a crazy person. But uh, I was allowed to uh, be in on the creative work for the opening song and the closing number because part of the process is I've come all the way down here. What if I'm sitting next to Hank Beebe and we're now collaborating and to work on a song, you see me get choked up in the movie. Uh, this long saga cul culminates with him and I working on something together. It's just mind blowing. And we've written other songs together and, and we're, we still are in touch. He's 96 years old. I was up visiting him in Maine a couple of months ago so that side of the movie, I did get to put my uh, put my toe in the water of creativity, but mostly it's it's just Deva with her filmmaking artistry, and I'm just trailing after. Well, and you also brought your personality and such an interesting hobby, so I think that's what helped make the film so great. Oh yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it would have been a totally other thing if it was just about corporate musicals without Steve and his passion for them and finding them in these dusty record bins all these years later. That's, that's the magic. Yeah. But it took a while with your samples that you were editing together before producers and funders understood that. I think early on you were thinking, I have to prepare for a version of the movie in which Steve is not a very big part of it because no one knows who he is and we don't know if people like him. So there was a certain amount of, uh proving that i was worthy of being in the movie <laughs> to other people <laughs> awesome yeah thank you so much oh yeah thank you yeah do you have any questions steve <laughs> no i was waving goodbye i oh. have no question <laughs> our, our, <laughs> i only have an answer our internet is choppy i said there's a snowstorm outside when i walked up you were just like you you you, you were frozen for a moment i thought you were yeah. raising, raising your hand I, I thought it was cool that one of the people came into the screen and actually had the big hat with the flaps. Yeah, I, yeah, I saw that too. I mind that. Um, uh, let's see, I think it's Nicole. Uh, some people haven't followed my instruction of putting their name in and have said, I have a question, but I don't see the names. I think this is Nicole Hoffman. The chat's only like direct messaging. Are we supposed to put in like a... Yeah, it goes to me. Oh, all right. Nicole, are you with us? Yes, I'm right here. <laughs> uh, hi, my name's Nicole, and uh, I'm heading into my senior year here at UVU, and I'm in the post-production track. Um, and I have a question for you, Deva. I know you said that you have a background in post-production, and I have recently found myself kind of in the realm of directing as well, and I'm finding that it's not super, super uncommon like I thought it was. Um, so... I was just wondering, like, was directing ever something you had in mind and how do you let those roles kind of coincide? Um, for a long time, I just really loved editing. That was, I was not thinking that I would be directing. Um, but then 
years go by and you're working on people's projects and you're helping them and you're realizing maybe they don't have as many ideas as you might have. And why are they getting this chance to do this? And maybe I should be doing that. So really the the bathtubs was the, I mean, I had kind of on two trains, I took more of a supervisory role on a lot of stuff, but um, bathtubs was the first thing where I said, I, this is a story I can tell, and I think I'll do it better than, especially like these other people who are sending their stuff to Steve and it's going to be like this journalistic exercise and I should do this. And so that was the first one where I said, I'm going to try it. And I, I, I feel like I can do it and I hope I can do it. And it was really hard and very satisfying. Like it was that thing where challenges and the scary stuff is like the really stuff that's the stuff you should be doing. Cause it's, it's scary, I guess. So I want, yeah, it's, but it's been really hard to get another directing gig that is quite as, um, satisfying. I mean, I've been doing my own stuff. Like Steve and I have done some comedy projects since then scripted stuff where I directed and he wrote it. That's been super satisfying. Um, but yeah, people just want me to edit. That they're used to me editing. They're used to me solving problems that way, fixing things, uh, finding the story where they can't find the story. So that's what people want to hire me to do. And it, I'm in a weird transition spot right now um, where I'm just going to have to keep doing my own stuff to keep proving it to people that I can do it. So that's the honest answer. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I will say you did a fantastic job with directing. Thank really you. Cool. Of course. Right, then. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kelsey. I think this is like my second year. Um, and I was just wondering, so I noticed you said that you usually save a little bit of your budget for animation. So I was kind of just wondering, like, what role does animation play in your creative process? Um, well, in bathtubs and in two trains running, it played, it was, it was really important. Um, I mean, in bathtubs, it was, we could have survived without it, but I just, I guess I just wanted to do it in bathtubs. Um, and there were a couple of little sections where like when, when sport and Steve are up against each other collecting, I didn't really have anything visually that would work there and and uh, and I knew I wanted some kind of fun opening thing. And by that point, I'd worked with these guys at Mind Bomb Films, and they'd done the stuff for Two Trains Running and and uh, a lot of the motion graphics. I was like, I just have to work with these guys again. So that's how that developed. But um, with Two Trains Running, did you guys watch that one? It um, we had so much footage of the civil rights era, but we had nothing of the blues guys going to the South to try to find these blues players who may or may not be dead. And, and the, the (laughs) one guy was a photographer, but all of his amazing stills uh, were destroyed in a flood, like in his attic, all water damaged. We couldn't get and salvage any of them. So it was like, we have nothing from that whole part of the story. So we have to do, you know, it could have been reenactments, I guess, but I told the the main producer, I, I loved this stuff in searching for Sugar Man and the way they did animation. And he was like, well, just call those guys. <laughs> so I did. And so they did it. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's always weighing what, you know, first, what really floats your boat and what you really need for the story. That's yeah. Is that a, I could probably go into it more if you wanted, um, no. but okay. <laughs> My question. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Um, Chip, you already asked, I see Janelle. I think it's Janelle. Zoom kind of cuts off their names. Yes, Janelle Christensen. Someone once said that Zoom is kind of like a seance, you know? (laughs) Janelle, are you here? (laughs) If you're here, Janelle. (laughs) 
That's the first time I've heard that. That's perfect. <laughs> I don't think I don't think Janelle is here anymore. <laughs> How about Calvin? Bring in the spirit of Janelle. Knock, knock Janelle if you're here. <laughs> Come to us. Or don't if you don't want to. Calvin. I'm in just speak speaker mode, so I don't see these people. Calvin, no Calvin, maybe I'm just not hearing people. I'm feeling like I'm having technical issues. No, not Calvin. I see a, I see a Calvin and he's waving. Oh, I don't see Calvin. But I don't hear his voice. Oh, there he is. Yeah, Calvin, I'm not sure we can hear you, right? Try. I see your face, but you're really frozen up. Maybe Janelle is too. The spirits are shy. I know. I guess so. <laughs> keep trying, trying, Calvin. Here, he's keep... not muted. He's not muted. Not muted. Just try shouting. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he looks frozen. Me. How about David Gladhell? Can you speak, Gavin? Oh, he... his mouth oh. moved. I don't know. This is. How about, can you hear me now? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. All right. Um, well, I'm David. I am finishing up my associates actually in web development, so I'm not part of the program. Um, but I wanted to say that, uh, but I was really happy with the movie. I thought that um, end musical number was at least as good as La La Land. So <laughs> take that for what it's worth. Um, <laughs> And shot in one day. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Um, my question is for Steve, but Deva, you can answer too, obviously. Um, was there anyone that you were really hoping to be featured in the movie, someone that you were trying to track down um, that just for whatever reason was not possible? Uh, without going into names, really, I will say that the enduring stigma of being known as a performer or composer who spent a lot of their career in this particular shadow world uh, made some people reluctant to even talk about it. And there was an interesting divide. The superstars, Florence Henderson, Cheetah Rivera, they had, they weren't worried anymore about, oh no, we don't like them because they're those people. They, they had graduated out of that worry and they were ready to talk at length about it. these shows were actually fantastic. This was a list people up and down the line. It, Florence Henderson said, and I don't know, I don't think this was in the movie, but she said, those Oldsmobile shows I did, I would put them up, up against anything that was on Broadway. They were that good. Yes, they were about Oldsmobiles, which is crazy, but there were other people who were not that famous who even decades later, were very worried that if this is associated with them, that their their careers could be damaged. If it's oh, that's too bad. That actress we were considering hired hiring. Apparently, she's done a lot of those uh, corny, crass, uh, disrespectable industrials. We don't. So people were still worried about that. And there were a few people we approached who uh, hemmed and hawed and then withdrew. That's a real shame. Well, yeah. Thank you. But there were people who are in the movie who had some misgivings about it, swallowed hard, did it, and then saw the movie and felt like, oh my God, a weight has come off my shoulders. Now the world finally understands and we're not being made fun of. Almost everybody I approached over the years, they hear a Letterman writer wants to talk to you. They're worried they are about to be made fun of. And it took a while for me to make people understand I'm not here to mock you. Yes, at first we were making fun of the records on the show. I've graduated past that. I'm curious now. I have great respect for creativity that blossoms in these strange outlands. And I want to find out more about how you did it and what it meant to you. And then people finally got it and relaxed. And that's the, the spirit of the movie is that it takes a long time sometimes to feel okay about these weird things you've done with your life. And Hopefully you don't need someone else to validate all of it, but it feels really good if you're 80 or 90 and someone says, I love that thing you did. I know not many people understand it, but I love it. And I want to ask you more about it. That made a lot of people feel great. 
Well, that catharsis was really what made the what made the documentary happen for me. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks. I will say John Cander was one that we really wanted from he he did cabaret and everything. And and he I he just it just never happened. But he also did an amazing GE musical. It's like phenomenal. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Okay. Uh hi. Um, thank you guys for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. We really appreciate this. Uh, my name is Perry. I am in my third year here at UVU and I'm in the post-production track, hopefully editing. Um, but this next question is also for Steve. I'm curious if you started this record collecting journey with this end goal that you would just kind of accumulate as much records as you could before you called it quits or if you started this journey um kind of with this goal to just find out as much as you could it was very open-ended like by the time I had five or six of them and I started to realize I think this is a genre and no one that I know has ever heard of it and it's very hard to explain but there are insurance salesman musicals and diesel engine dealer musicals. How much of this is there? Could there be 20 of these? What if there were 30 of them? Now I have like 200 something, but I'm still finding them. At some point, I think fairly early on, I tried to approach some hip record labels and said, I got this crazy record collection and I, here's some samples and they would say, oh, well, that's fascinating. Uh, who owns the rights to all this stuff? And then I would get, ah, gee, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's very murky. And Deva found the same thing years later when she was trying to look through this. This stuff was never supposed to be released to the public. It was never intended for airplay. Some of it was copyrighted. Some of it wasn't. It's all over the map. Very, very hard for an amateur like me to figure out. So I just, all right, I'll just keep collecting the records. And then my friend Sport said, I know some people who have this cool little publishing company. They might like this. They do these weird hidden history books. I said, that would be the ultimate. That's as much as I could ever hope for. And the book took a couple of years to get done and it was great. And I felt relaxed, like, all right, that can be the end now. But then Deva said, I don't think that's the end because of all the stories you're telling me about the people. And, and so it just kept, this would have been enough. That would have been enough. That would have been enough. And there are still records I'm looking for, but if I never find them, I'm okay with that because the story has been told. The, it's been saved now. It was almost off the edge forever into the abyss and with Davis movie we never have to worry about that this stuff getting lost anymore so I, I if I find more records great but it's not like keeping me up at night he he did get a copy of gold growing finally the one the one that he was that's in the movie where he's like this is the only known copy well at least there's two now yeah, Don Bowles had it, and oh, if I ever find another one, I'll give it to you. But he didn't end up finding another one, but there was somebody who watched the movie and got in touch. Hey, I have that record. And I said, what? Would, would you trade it? Would you sell it? You don't have it yet? I said, no, you can't get that record. There's none. Well, now there's two, but I, he said, the guy in Illinois said, I have to send it to you. It needs to be with you. So that to us was the spirit of the whole bathtubs movie too just like the joy in somebody else's success and gratification was so much of what we were working with so that was a beautiful postscript that's fantastic okay sweet thank you so much yeah i feel bad calvin can you speak to us yeah you figured i i think i think this should be working now perfect yeah. okay excellent Got a lot of technology problems. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Calvin Berg, uh, somewhere between a sophomore and a junior. And I wanted to ask, how did you get the location for the musical number at the end of the film? Like, what was that location? What was it like shooting there? Uh, tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah, well, at first we thought we were gonna do a musical number inside a theater and we scouted all over Los Angeles. Uh, not all over, but into the, in the downtown theater district and looked at it and 
And then it was like, we don't really have enough money to build sets. So we need something where the set is kind of already there. So let's do it. You know, there's all these back lots in LA. Let's check them out. So we toured different back lots and, and just <laughs> got quotes. Like we had, I hired a, a producer specifically for the musical number who dealt with stuff like that more. And, and so we just got quotes from different places and Warner brothers ended up being the right look, the right calendar dates and the right decent price. I mean, it was definitely not cheap, but um, I would say that last musical number, the whole thing, including planning and the whole thing was like, and you know, techno crane, like the whole was like the biggest crew we had on the whole documentary over four years of filming it. It was like a hundred thousand dollars to get that whole that one you know one day shoot but like you know it's a tractor and <laughs> it's going you know um costumes and the whole thing so that was yeah that was um and, uh, i was just going to add we had a friend who had a connection to vintage car enthusiasts and suddenly yeah. people were volunteering to bring in their 55 chevys and 63 corvettes and all that and lining the streets with something that was so beautiful and powerful and evocative like and i pointed out to dave at one point you have a, an archival clip of a 55 chevy being assembled and it's the like 50 millionth gm car coming down the line and there's one of those exact same models on the street in the finale and i know we didn't plan it that way but there were those serendipitous little magical things and the whole i mean it was a long day i mean i think the call time was like 5 30 a.m because we had from when the sun is up till when the sun goes behind the buildings and then we're done whether we want to be done or not but just looking around me that day was one of the most surreal experiences of my life because all right here's a couple of my record collector buddies here's two punk rock legends here's uh Peter Sean from the 1976 Exxon musical. And here's Pat and Sandy from the bathrooms are coming and we're all just hanging out on a film set and marching down. <laughs> How could anything ever top the conceptual wildness of that? I don't think anything ever could for me. Yeah. I think we all felt like, Oh my God, we're on a, like a real sound stage, Like, you know, like we're making a movie now, you know, and, and just, yeah, to have Pat and Sandy who are, pros you know they started doing this years ago they still just like on it it was just so wonderful to to let them get out there and show their stuff you know they're in their 70s and they're still kicking ass it was just it was like one of the best days ever and so hard I almost fainted once it was so, <laughs> so intense <laughs> but it was so worth it yeah the two punk rock legends were utterly starstruck by being in the presence of the two women from the bathrooms are coming because they both had had this record for years it was this iconic fragment of american peak weirdness and they loved the songs in the same way that i did this shouldn't ever have happened but it did and it's been preserved and it's actually fabulous and now oh my god here's the two ladies and uh, will you sing for us can we be in pictures with you it was so charming yeah that's truly incredible um i mean it was just came together so well so like hats off to you honestly it just i was blown away by how how amazing the set looked and i was just like wow how how did they even get that you know but wow that's that's incredible thank you how are you guys holding up we've got about six questions left does that sound doable bring it on yeah, nice. yeah. okay you're awesome ethan ethan hawkins Hi guys, how's it going? Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Sweet, perfect. So I'm in my fourth year. I had to, had to count for a minute, but um, <clears throat> I thought it was really interesting as we started watching this, realizing that it was about um, industrial musicals because my whole family is in the musical industry. Uh, my mom is a musical theater major. My sisters are going into it. And none of us had heard of this before. We had never heard of an industrial musical or a corporate musical. And I was just, I was kind of shocked about that because I was like, there's no way that we've never heard of this before. Like this, this is, it's obviously a part of the industry. So how is that, how is it flown under the radar, the radar so well? And I, I started to realize after you guys talked about it, how so many of these things were made 
just the, the once and then they were closed and that was it and they were also like really private so i was wondering like after this experience of, of pulling and archiving all these pieces together how that's affected like you guys when it comes to dealing with media and actually keeping that that way it doesn't get lost to time again well that yeah well on a, just a practical level i had steve he told me he hadn't digitized all the songs that he had i don't know it's like what are you talking about you need to get everything just right now i need you to scan every song like i need digital files of everything you have you know mm -hmm. So, uh, and then we started a database, you know, um, to track it. And it was, yes, yeah, thousands of songs. Um, there were, I, I would give her, oh, here's like four dozen really good ones. All right, here's another four dozen. And then she'd say, somebody in an interview mentioned this one. What about that? Well, I guess I haven't given you. What haven't you given me? Well, thousands, I guess. <laughs> oh, so, that was one project. Um, very worthwhile. I'm glad I now have hard drives in multiple states with thousands of files from all this stuff saved. But man, yeah, archiving, it's it's st still such a question for me about m my own stuff. Like, what are we going to do with all this stuff, all these terabytes of information that we have and making sure that we don't have them on hard drives that die and, you know, uh, or LTO or whatever, you know, it's, yeah, that's the big question. So for now, I just make sure I have stuff on multiple hard drives. But the original source but, material, you see that scene where I'm in Hank Beebe's basement loft and these rotting cardboard boxes are spilling out music manuscripts and it's just thrilling and horrifying. He and his family have uh, put everything in sealable plastic bins, so they've at least sort of upped their game with preservation, and all these families now know, all right, we're not going to throw away dad's stuff because we understand that in a way that we wouldn't have before, that it is part of a history that people now care about. So again, there's a feeling like relief that, all right, it's not just all going to end up in a landfill. Uh, plenty has over the years gone into landfills but we have enough that we, we kind of know the picture sweet perfect yeah i lost i lost a couple of scenes from like a old short from like years ago digitally and i was like heartbroken at that and so i was always just curious how everyone manages to, to archive and keep their stuff alive now so sweet thank you yeah it's a big question though seriously <laughs> important question Addison. Hey, so I'm just wondering, how is creating an animated series or like a cartoon different from making something live action? Um, well, the animated stuff takes so much pre-planning, you know? Um, I mean, I guess live action scripted stuff does too, but um, for two trains, I I kind of wrote out what, and this was kind of wild that the, the director, I was not the director of that film, but uh, they kind of charged me with supervising the animation. Um, so I wrote out what I, what I needed the scene to do. And then we storyboarded it first and then did animatics. Um, and so, and then it's, and then, a lot of like layout style kind of things to see like what style does the director want and that kind of thing. And then finally it's all just like nailing down. Okay, this is the look he wants. This is the storyboard and the animatic we're doing. And then they kind of go to town, but it, it, it um, it's really time consuming, especially those guys, they worked in, they were from Sweden. Um, they did, it was all hand drawn. <laughs> it took, it took so long. It took so long. Um, there are other houses, uh, like there was, we had to eventually take some of it to a house in Burbank and they, they had a much quicker process, but it wasn't hand drawn. It didn't look as quite as beautiful, but, um, yeah, I think it's at least in documentary where you don't have lots of budget. It, it's just trying to do as much storyboarding and animatics as you can with the so you're you know you have this audio of what you're doing and 
kind of get as close as you can before they really start doing every frame. Is that I forgot to, Yeah, by the way, I forgot to introduce myself. Addison Nuttall, Settle, entering my third year of here going into the writing track, incredibly passionate about cartoons specifically. So, oh, right on. yeah. Cool. I hope uh, that I answered your question somehow, at least for, for me and what I have been doing in documentary, that's how it's worked. Yeah. Like, yeah. Also, is there a way to like see these things like online? Like, have you put a lot of these, have either you put a lot of these songs or these videos online? Or at least the ones that you legally could. Yeah. yeah. There yeah. is a beautiful, uh, very lengthy soundtrack for the Bathtubs movie that you can get either digitally or in a deluxe two disc vinyl set with a big uh, gatefold album and liner notes and behind the scenes photos and notes about all the tracks that I wrote up. So music, uh, for the most part, we were able to get what we wanted for that. Uh, the video, the visual elements, the films and so on, we keep fairly close to the vest. Uh, you see in the movie, I do a, a show where I, I come to a theater and have all these of uh, films that I show and it's like the 20 minutes that have survived of the bathrooms are coming movie and the 20 minute full GE and the Purina dog chow and then this and then that and we don't put those online because I do want to preserve the specialness of the the bathtubs experience as well as uh, the the show that I do but yeah it's on Spotify um you know uh iTunes and all that like bathtubs over Broadway soundtrack and then what's the one you have on is it on oh yeah amazon and apple music i did put together a compilation of best of the 50s best of the 60s best of the 70s and those are all under the everything's coming up profits title i believe so you can get a lot of music probably as much as most civilians will really want <laughs> yeah for enough how do you Hey, I'm uh, sorry. Am I allowed to ask more than two questions? No, no. We got we got people here, and these guys need to go to bed. Sorry, Addison. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we got Pete Anderson waiting in the wings. Italy darn. <laughs> um. Hi, I'm Pete Anderson. Uh, this is my first year at UBU. I'm in the directing track. Uh, my question is for both of you. The um, the sequence where you Steve, Steve you sang with Pat on stage. How was how was that? Was that just surreal for you? I was just imagining how happy I would be doing that because that that scene made me just so happy to see you doing that. It it did come together beautifully. I was starting to go out around the country with this one man show with these films. Pat lived about an hour west of Chicago, I think it was. I said, Pat, I'm coming into Chicago. I'm going to do this show. If you could, if you'd be interested, I'd love to have you come in and be at the show. And after we've screened the 20 minutes of this crazy bathrooms are coming movie, if I invite you up on stage, number one, the audience will go nuts. And number number two, if, if you sing and I play guitar and I know we can do this, the audience will be transported. They will just not believe the crazy historical moment they're witnessing. And she, oh, I don't know. She's very modest. She was she's still singing fantastically uh hasn't professionally for quite a while but still had the pipes so she said okay i'll do it i'll come in and and it went exactly as i predicted it, it was just everything lined up and deva was there with her camera and captured forever so yes yeah, surreal and beautiful and uh one of those great moments of my life that uh right up there in that top rank of things i don't think will ever be surpassed she yeah that moment when she turns and starts to cry when people are cheering for her for something that she was never able to even explain to people it's like and it's that thing that that song is great because it's funny but it's also beautiful and very touching you know i love that something can be those two things at the same time and i think people get that with that song and i think they really appreciated her having the guts to get up there and do that. Yeah, that's one of my favorite moments, the whole thing.
I call that song the gateway drug. You can say, oh, I've got these crazy music uh, songs about selling tractors or sneakers or whatever. But as Pat very uh, wisely said to me at one point, you know, not very many people have a tractor, but everyone has a bathroom. That song speaks to everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, we've got Ben McCormick. Mm -hmm. No, oh, Ben, I know he wants to ask a question. Where Ben? Come forth. <laughs> what would Ben be likely to ask if he were to ask? Uh, <laughs> I know. What's does. your favorite color? Oh, yeah, that's totally Ben. Uh, purple. Yeah, if you know, if you, oh, same, by the way, if you know Ben, <laughs> which He's I don't, I by the ben, way, but if you ben know you Ben, that might maybe be something he'd ask. All right. Hi, okay. Ben. Good to see you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ben, we, we don't have Ben, right? Or we do? I see him. Here. We yeah, we, he, we can hear him. He's okay. alive. Okay. So first off, I, I, I did, I did want to say I really did like the documentary. But the one thing that stood out to me the most that really drew me in was um, how was like the parts of the hobby that you guys showed. How did you guys ultimately decide which parts of the hobby to show like for example you guys talked about how like oh we'll like trade records or whatever but you didn't really go go down that rabbit hole like you guys focused on only particular parts of the hobby what kind of made you guys decide which parts to show in the documentary you mean that like when he's getting to to together with the other collectors just the whole thing in general because the um the actual hobby itself like because you could have probably explained so many different things about the hobby, but you guys kind of narrowed it down just to the direct points that were in the documentary. Like what made you guys decide on those particular points? How do you refine a documentary? Um, well, there were certain things I knew I needed to hit. Like uh, I knew he was going to go, I knew I needed to kind of have him get sucked in initially by what he was doing on the late show and making fun of those things and just thinking like, wait a second, what is this? Um, oh my God, this is a whole world. Uh, and then he goes to start meeting the people. So I needed a launch point. Like I just followed three act structure basically um, and the hero's journey, no kidding. Um, pretty basic stuff. So, you know, he, you, you establish in act one, the, the, the world, as it stands, his regular world as a comedy writer. And then he finds something unusual. That's kind of the turning point 10 minutes in. And then, you know, 20 minutes, end of act one, beginning of act two, he's off on the journey, right? And so then you have to kind of, in that act two part, explain some of what this stuff is because it's so hard to understand. So I think I just used enough to kind of help people understand his passion and and what this stuff was. So you kind of figure that out as you go. Um, but then I, I had such great scenes, just natural, beautiful, funny verite scenes, like when he's with John Ward and they're singing the songs and we put the music underneath it and it matched up exactly with the song. Um, so it was just like hardcore nerding out. Like they both knew those songs without even hearing the actual music playing. It's like, this has to be in the movie. So, so it was just really, what are the kind of beautiful stellar moments that have to be in? And then just kind of structuring them out. Three act structure. I believe in three act structure. I just want to say that there is always a time to break it, but it, it really helps you at the beginning some parts of the collecting stuff are not that photogenic like you get a glimpse of me on the animation thing sitting at a computer looking through ebay but you really don't want 45 minutes of me scrolling through which is what the bulk of looking for these records is uh, you can allude to that but the good stuff is uh the visuals of the album covers and the audio of the songs just enjoying the the fruits of it and the hunt uh, it can be exciting in flashes, but uh, mostly the, the fun stuff is going to be what you have found and what it looks like and what it sounds like. 
did we get close on on answering that or is there another uh yeah, yeah okay. you, you, you guys did a good job it, it's okay. always nice to hear people that are really passionate about what like what it is that drives them every single day yeah there's so many weird collecting worlds out there that i'm constantly hearing about and really who's collecting miniature thimbles but i can't laugh at any of them because i'm right up there with why is he collecting that so i just say that's what human beings do okay well, I mean, I've got like action figures and like stuff behind me, like right now. So like everyone's got something. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, we got, thanks, Ben. We've got Aiden. We got two more questions, I think. I think if I'm counting right. Aiden, are you with us? Yeah, can you guys see and hear me? I know my background's like all black for some reason. Yeah. I'm not too sure what's going on there, but you can see me, right? Yes. All right, Hello. so. I'll just kind of summarize. So this question is for uh, Deva, and uh, thank you again for taking the time to be here. My pleasure. Uh, so I wrote it down. Basically, like when like coming up with like an idea for a documentary and like going out and making it, is there ever like a like the struggle between like trying to like you know like do due diligence to like whatever the idea is, but then getting like carried away with making it like too creative? You know, like is there like a balance between like originality and then I guess it's, that gets in the way of like what you're trying to like, I guess, like tell people. I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think, I think there's a lot of pressure when you're trying to get a film off the ground to be proving to people that you're, you know, this is going to be a groundbreaking film and we're going to use visual techniques that nobody's done before and everything. That's all cool. As long as you tell a good story. So if people have to be sucked in, they have to be engaged all the way through. You can't be doing that stuff. In my opinion, you can't be doing that stuff just to be cool or fun uh, uh, or, or just self-indulgent, I guess. To me, I, it's the story first and, and, and the, uh, the visuals support that, right? Like, um, I wish I'd had better cameras and better lenses and everything to do this movie, but I didn't. So I used what I had and, and I think the story comes across. Um, so I guess that's what I would say. Uh, I see, I see people get trapped in the style thing where that's the number one, um, most important thing to them that's uh, but you know that's cool do what you want but to me it's story first story first story first yeah suck people in like why are you making films I, I to me it's to connect with people um I guess other people would just want to like this is who I am or whatever that is so do do that that's cool but to me I want to connect with people I don't know. It's like, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that was a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We got our last question from so I think. Yes, yeah, Cecilia. Yeah, sorry. My <laughs> name is different. On the sorry, yeah. Hi, my name is Cecilia. I'm in my third year. I'm in the cinematography major. I my question was kind of answered with everybody else, but I was just wondering how many like hours of film you actually had towards the end of everything and how is you as like an editor like tackle that like how do you even like look at all that information and be like okay this is where I want to start the story yeah it, it can be really overwhelming um how many hours well we shot over the course of three or four years um there's a ton of archival footage uh probably I don't know. I should have done the hour tally. How many interviews do you think we did, Steve? Like uh, tons, tons there were hours. there were some people who didn't make it into the movie that we interviewed. There were lots of scenes of me going places that didn't make it in, or you only see for five seconds out of a three hour shoot or whatever. But I know you told me at one point uh, that you had enough good material to make three movies. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I had, I had also interviewed experts. Like somebody told me, oh, if you want a 
National Endowment of the Humanities grant, you have to interview experts. You have to have experts in your movie, like PBS style. And so I interviewed those people and I did a cut where I did a first act where they were in there talking and it was like, this is not the movie I want to make. This is like, so it's like the broccoli, you know, to the like chocolate cake. I'm not doing that. So I ripped them out and I used them as background. They're good information for me to have. I'm glad I interviewed those experts, but they were so boring on in the actual film, mm -hmm. not in real life. They're amazing, but just it sucked out the energy. Um, there was a second part to your question. It wasn't just how many hours it was. Oh, how do you figure out what to, what to use? Um, the one thing I know when I start a big editing project and I have so much material and, and it feels really overwhelming. I just tell myself, you just start with the, the scenes you love. Like when you're watching footage and you it's just like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's amazing. I take notes on all the stuff that I, you know, when I first watch it, it's like, that is amazing. That's a cool moment. I write all that stuff down and I start with those scenes and I just tell myself, don't worry about the whole thing. Just, just do these scenes that you know you love that are going to be good. And, and eventually it all starts to come together. So that's the thing. It's just like, don't worry about the whole movie, just little scenes. And then it starts to happen. Yeah. And then outlining, I outline like a crazy person. I love outlines. It really, really helps to whittle it down. Oh, thank you. Yep. Well, all right, guys. That was such a pleasure. So great to meet you, David. So fun to see you again, Steve. Yeah. Uh, it's such a great movie. And uh, I'm sure glad we had so many people here watching. And it's funny because uh, most of them are here. I just looked, I just looked, a uh, few dropped off just in the past few minutes, but I looked and said, wow, there's still like 65 people watching of 70 that, you know, over, so, so you even compel, you even compel people in a, in a, in a choppy Q and A. So right on. <laughs> well, thank you for having us. Uh, and just let me know if there's anything you need edited out that you feel shouldn't be uh, published <laughs> to the world. I'll give you a few days to think about that. All right. Okay. All right. Um, you. Yeah, if you have questions about stuff, you know, please find me on the internet, reach out. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, it's really nice of you. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Have a great night and a great Thanks. holiday. Thanks everybody. Bye -bye. Happy holidays. Bye.